go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw this first. That's like an intimidating title. And that was sort of on, <laughs> sort of on purpose because I want to make it clear, like, this isn't going to teach you two very, very advanced topics in one go around. So at the last slide I have, and I'll, I'll link to that after I'm done in the meetup, but uh, it's just a set of links and ways to get depth here. So, so what's this meetup going to be about? So it's going to be about impressions, right? Like I want you to get an impression of how you can put these different tools together to do useful things as developers. Um, at, at Plow, we are very bot, Plow Technologies, the company I work for, we're very bought in on functional programming. And um, TLA Plus is something we've come into uh, using here in the last two or three years. Um, but we've used enough of it now that I feel pretty comfortable recommending it as a tool, regardless of whether you use Haskell, although I think it, it really complements systems that have property testing well. Um, and just putting it all together is very, very nice. Um, so yeah, so you're going to see hints of how things work. Again, if you, if you need more detail, I have it. It's all, it's all based on stuff that works, but I'm not going to be like walking through an entire like program project. I just think it'd be too much for a presentation like this. And then obviously, please stop me and ask if you have any questions. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to just like sit here and drone on. Um, so, what is TLA plus? Um, first of all, I, I can't really ask the Twitch, but like you know, show of hands, how many people have heard of? TLA plus here in the room, two, three, probably about half. So it's about, I think, what is that, 10 people here, probably about half raise their hands. Yeah, it's been, it's been getting a little bit of press in like sort of uh, uh, meetup circles and YouTube circles. But um, it was developed by Leslie Lamport, who's like this really famous uh, CS guy who makes hilarious videos about TLA plus. Um, but it stands for the Temporal Logic of Actions. And that'll really make sense when you kind of see what it's doing. But basically, it's, it's a framework for developing the model that your code is based around. So this isn't going to be a tool that you're going to write something down and then push generate code. And it gives you some outputted uh, system, right? So there are tools that try and do stuff like that. I try to use them. I think TLA Plus is a better approach. You know, just in the same way of like if you're a web dev and you've tried to use Dreamweaver, you know, it's much better to build to use Sketch and then actually write the UI that this that the Sketch gives you a model for. Think of TLA Plus as a way to do that, but for the back end or for, for distributed systems, right? And that that's like you can feel how there's a gap there. Um, and um, I I really feel I really felt this gap because I found myself writing a lot of models where I would, I would have a lot of little boxes on the screen. And so I'd have you know, these little boxes, and they'd be connected together. And then everybody would be like, yeah, 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 I don't care about your model. I just want to go code something up, which I totally understand that, imp that, you know, that like, itch. You want, you want to get code there, right? But the problem is um, those boxes are useful for people outside of that group. And the other problem is code something up can be um, deceiving. Like You think you can be going in a good direction by doing that. But it turns out the interactions of the systems, especially in this world of microservices, are really what govern the behavior of the system. Um, so TLA plus allows you to scratch that itch to code something up, but then at the end of it, end up with a model that you can query across the entire system instead of about little pieces of it. Um, so uh, you know, just looking on the slide here, uh, some things that we've used TLA plus four. So communicating a spec among a group of people. So it's very common at Plow, we'll have one dev write a spec for a system, present it to a group, and then everyone can read the property tests, can read all the tests about it, and ask questions. Oh, what about this test? What about this? You can quickly add, you can quickly add depth and get buy-in from a group of devs. Um, uh, like I said, specifying a set of applications that need to work together, I think that's really the place it most shines. It's the most likely place that we use it, is if I'm specifying multiple systems. Um, uh, and then, uh, and that's sort of related to specifying distributed algorithms, which is why Leslie Lamport made it, was he was working on Paxos algorithm. He wanted a way to test it better. Um, and uh, lastly, programming something that has some sort of complicated time component. That's what a lot of my slides today are going to be about, because I think it's a really nice way of seeing how Haskell relates to all of this. Um, but it's a, you can, you can use it to move, move through states in time. There's a lot of, a lot of tools for saying what happened before, what happened next, what happens eventually. It's very nice. And so I mentioned scratching a coding itch, right? So 
uh, like I said, you, you often are programming, you often want to get to code in a hurry. But the problem is that, first of all, there's, there can be a lot of setup to test some idea. So like, let's say you're trying to test something like grab information out of a database and then write it to four services, hear three responses, and then do some sort of system action, right? Sure, you might want to just get some sort of mock system up. But do you really want that to become the core of your uh, project? No. Is it likely to once you write that code? Yes. Uh, you know, nobody wants you to rewrite anything. This is a way of getting that piece scratched and uh, asking questions across those systems without actually writing the code. So you can very easily say, well, this isn't the system, I have to rewrite it. So think about that as like a, a feature. And again, like code, often not enough, right? Um, the, there, there can be so many little pieces that you just, you think you understand when you write a simple toy model that you don't understand and it becomes apparent once you put it in practice. Okay, so uh, now it's time to tell a little story so that we can have a model that we can talk about. Um, so starting out, we're going to have a we're going to have a client and a server, and this this is going to represent say like say you're designing a, a cell modem or something, and that you're going to have some web interface where you can change the you can change the IP of the cell modem, all right? Or you're designing some other thing where you can actually change the network settings. So it's very important if you're doing something like that. That, that you know that the client after those changes will still be able to reach it or the changes should revert. Um, so uh, this is sort of based on a, on a problem we had at work and I thought it was a, a nice one for this. So you naturally start making your boxes. So you have your client, you have your server, and then those boxes become a flow chart and you have, uh, you know, your client, your client last knows the state of server state one, um, then the client asks, for the state to be changed to server state to, to network state two, and then assuming it can ping and pong, it stays on network state two, but if it can't ping and pong, it goes back to network state one. So a pretty simple model. You might also think about like displays on your computer. If you change your display settings, it's a really common place you'll see this. You'll say, you know, you have 15 seconds to accept it or the thing times out. Um, so uh, yeah. so. So I'm a big fan of flowcharts. I, I, I really like them. I just think that people try and do too much with them. I think this is about as much as you would ever want to do with a flowchart. This is already so I'm like, oh god, there's too many boxes. Nobody's going to actually look at this. And so there's sort of like a, a limit, right? But the reason I like flowcharts is they're very good at certain things. First of all, everybody under, can understand quickly what the thing is supposed to do, right? So in TLA Plus, we call that liveness. So it's what the application or what the system is actually supposed to do. And flowcharts are very good at modeling that, modeling the good path. Um, you know, they help, again, spread this out of the developers and into other people who might be uh, uh, stakeholders in the system. And they're good for communicating to people who, you know, are not going to look at your TLA plus model, for instance. But where they get really annoying is once you start thinking about exception handling, once you start thinking about bad path stuff, right? TLA is, is much better at this. So complementing timeouts, you know, system pauses, all the things that uh, go wrong that you don't want to add 27 new branches on your flowchart for because it's going to confuse everyone who looks at it. But you still care. You still care about those things. In fact, as developers, it's really all you spend your time doing. So um, uh, that's where TLA is very, very helpful. All right, so let's look at a TLA program. Okay, so I'm going to sort of start by building this up in just little pieces. Um, so uh, TLA, there's two flavors of TLA. There's plus cal and TLA plus, and a lot of times people start out showing everyone TLA plus, and then they say, oh, just switch to plus cal. So I don't use plus cal. I just use this because I don't want it to look like pseudocode. I want it to look like this. Um, but uh, here you have a module, and every TLA, uh, TLA plus program is a module. Um, this one's going to be called ping think and you can see us you can see a few things already. So first of all, there's not a lot here um, but I'm defining a constant and I'm defining some variables. Uh, usually the variables are going to be the things that hold state. Um, so uh, you're you know like if you have a server, time obviously is going to be something stateful. Uh, in my case, I, you know, I'm not modeling the client explicitly. There's an art to this part of it, right? Just like there's an art to making a good flowchart or a good model or a good sketch diagram. Whatever you're doing when you're doing modeling, there's always a bit of art. 
Um, right. So uh, then once you've got once you've got those variables made, you need to decide what you're talking about. This is probably one of my favorite things. As a, as a Haskell dev, you spend a lot of time developing type systems and like thinking about the way your types flow through your program. This, this is a very um, similar idea. Um, again, you, know, you create sets that are going to define the flow of information through your project. Uh, so I have a note here, you know, keep things simple. Like if you're doing something like this, um, don't try and have like sets of crazy things. Uh, there's a, there's a you know, combinatoric engine that TLA plus uses. And so if you start trying to get crazy, you will find your model gets very slow very quickly. So uh, a lot of, uh, you know, it likes sets the most. And what I mean by that is there's sets and sequences and a few other things. It, I find that I have the most luck if I try and make everything a set and avoid every other data structure that it has. It seems like it has the best support for it. But I don't, I don't have any, like, way of proving that other than a heuristic. Um, uh, you know, here's, here's a few that I'm defining. So I've got the network state, so it's going to be active or inactive. So active means everything's working, everything's online, and we haven't received anything. Inactive, uh, you know, means we're, we're going to have to start doing a ping, and we're going to have to start trying to look to a way to get the states back active. I made a couple of fake network profiles. Your real network profiles in a program would be a lot more complicated than just N1, N2. It would probably involve some IP addresses, some ports, uh, maybe an interface setting, all kinds of stuff. But in ours, it's N1 and N2. So right, so it's all about trying to get that right level of detail so you can test the model without having to build out an entire programming system. Um, uh, down below, you see a different kind of set. So that's still a set, time. And what that says is T is a member, uh, T is in naturals. And those naturals are limited to my time limit. So if you remember from this slide, do I have a mouse? Uh, okay, I do not. But if you remember from this slide, constants, time limit, that's the time limit we're going to do. So when we get ready to run this TLA plus code, we'll do it in the TLA plus toolbox, and there'll be a spot to set that time limit so you can play with it. Um, but the, the time has to be less than that time limit, so I have basically like a bounded set of naturals. Um, so you can already see it's starting to seem a, like, you know, there's a little bit of mathy stuff. And the truth is that TLA plus has a built-in theorem prover in it. I don't know why you would ever use that theorem. There are much better theorem provers in the world. But that should give you an idea of, like, the point of view that they're coming from, right? So it's very, like, formal methods. But I, you know, when I say, say formal methods, I then have to say, you can use this without understanding formal methods. Like, you can just dive in. It's not something that's crazy. OK, so now we have our sets, which are, sort of play the role of types slash terms in our, um, in our model here. And uh, next, we need to define something that's going to hold the state of our state variable, in our case, server. And in this case, it's going to be this little record type. So some of this syntax is really strange. It just takes a little bit of getting used to. I, I don't know if I like it, but uh, I sure use it. Uh, uh, so you have uh, server here, which again I'm defining. I'm defining uh, what the type of my server is going to be. So I'm saying that ser that that server is going to have a state with a network state. It's going to have a network profile. It's going to have a status of connected or unconnected, and it's going to receive a set of messages. Right? Again, each of the fields in this record is a is a set. Um, I try and use custom names. Uh, for each of those sets. In other words, I don't just write int or nat or something like that here, even if I could. Uh, just that way I have a little bit more control later. I don't know how necessary that is. It's really more of a Haskell thing. But um, uh, Yeah, and th these records, they're actually defined as functions. Um, but I don't want to get into all that. But they are very different. And um, you can use it like this easily. But when you start trying to use it in earnest, that those differences can matter. And you should just read about them. That's more of that. I'm not going to go into every detail. Or I will just stay on this slide for the rest of the presentation. So. OK. So then this is the next part of the state. We've got init. And then next. So this, I forgot to put a typo on this one. That's awesome. Um, but uh, init to next, this is the main transaction that occurs in the TLA model. 
right? So init is the very first way that things go, and then next iterates through every other state in the model. So next it goes init, and really what this is saying is init, next, 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 next. Like it just goes on and on and on. Um, so, you know, we introduce everything in init. Um, oh, and one other thing. One, one way that TLA is different than programming, at every single one of these uh, uh, declarations, uh, be it init or next or any others you're about to see, every single state, every single variable in the model always has to be defined. You always have to say what you're doing with it. And that just helps make sure that your state machines and that everything you're trying to do is actually capturing the full uh, complexity of the model. Um, it's really one of the most important things about it. Um, yeah, so, and then yeah, uh, I'm even gonna skip the part about induction because I think that's probably wrong. So, um, so again, so I mentioned earlier init. This is the first thing that happens in your code. So it's always the first line, uh, or the first, first uh, procedure here that's called. And so what we're doing, the little caret up symbol there, that means and. So we're saying init is equal to uh, checking uh, to this action. So it's the server is being set to this state and the time is being set to zero. Um, each variable is declared um, and the little arrow with the pipe at the beginning means assign this state to this variable in the record. Like I said, the syntax is kind of crazy. Um, and there's a lot of it. But, but uh, yeah, you get used to it. Okay. So this is the next state, right? So um, the carrots facing down there, the arrow facing down, is um, saying or. And again, we're going to start with a very simple model. And again, we're going to start by modeling the good path. So we're going to start by making something that works very much like a flowchart would work. So you're going to initiate a change, you're going to respond to the change. Um, or nothing's going to change. So those are the three things that, that can happen. Um, um, yeah, uh, and then you see unchanged is a keyword. Uh, that means that nothing's, in that state, nothing's going to change. Everything's just going to stay the same. Okay, so initiate change. So now we're going to look at each of these pieces, right? So these little or statements are really what, I, what really create the branching nature of your model. So every or is going to be a path that, that TLA can walk down to see how the model behaves, right? So this first one, mes uh, message initiate change, what is it doing? Well, first look at the and statements there. You have, a, it's saying that we're only going to run initiate change if uh, currently uh, we have no message in the queue. Um, and also that the state of the system is active and that the system is connected. Um, and then whenever we initiate change, we're going to in increment our time. Um, so I go back and forth. Sometimes I make all the time stuff completely separate from my model and kind of try and have them separated. It, it, it's, it makes it a lot simpler to write to keep the time just nearby what you're doing. But if you mess with it, you can see why that's sort of like a design decision. But anyway, uh, all of that just is getting the conditions ready. So if all of those conditions are met, then we are going to iterate our server. So that's what server prime and time prime mean, is it means we're going to take the old value, so I look at time. So we're going to take the old value of time, we're going to add one to it, and we're going to save it as time prime, right? And so prime has a special syntactic meaning in TLA+. Plus. What it means is the next thing coming. So after we get done running, running this, Time, all the primes are going to be the next state of the system and get you ready for your next loop. Um, so looking at server prime, you can, see a, you can see a little bit more syntax there. So we have server, except that we're going to change one thing about the server. So everything's going to be the same in server, except for message is now going to be changed. Um, did I cover all that? Oh, I sure did. All right, so I'm going to go on. Okay, so... Um, uh, now, once I get a change, I might want to do some stuff with that change. So in this case, uh, there might be, uh, I'm going to have that change request. If the, if the system works a certain way, I'm going to do a ping request. If it works in a different way, 
I'm going to do a Pong request. Um, and uh, you see, like, you kind of compose those different predicates of this model together so that you can, so you can have another branching layer for TLA+. Plus. Um, and then I was also saying, like, it's a very TDD style, like, if you're used to um, type-driven design or uh, test-driven design. The T means something different for me. Uh, but uh, the same ideas, right? You're, you're going you're gonna to specify a bunch of red states and then work your way down from there. And so it's a, it's a real similar idea. Um, Okay, so now one of the things is, all right, so a change request is, is, is there. We need to do something with it. So I'm only going to show one of those instead of showing all of them just so we can kind of keep going. But um, uh, we, got our, we got our change from the last thing that we looked at. Um, we're still making sure that the system's active and that the status is connected because it doesn't make any sense for us to change things if we're already disconnected. Um, we're going to increment time again. And now we're going to go ahead and make, our, make more of our server change state. So I'm going to move the state into inactive, which is going to say, OK, now we need something to bring it back online. Um, I'm going to change the status of the uh, connection to unconnected. And I'm going to go ahead and change the network profile to the new one, N2, right? So from here, you would then do your ping and your pong. And assuming all that worked well, it would come back and work. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too hand wavy, but I wanted to talk about, okay, once you've got all that built, what do you do? So that's all the good path stuff, right? So that's everything that's supposed to happen. But one of the things I said is you'll be able to ask questions of that model, right? So I wanted to get to that. Um, but before I do, I, I really needed to talk about this spec piece here. Um, so the spec is actually the model definition, and you'll see some of this again uh, in a few other slides, but uh, the first thing is that uh, this, is a, this is what's called a temporal formula, which means that these operators are temporal operators, so they, they operate on the, on the incremental nature of the TLA model. Um, so what this is saying is that uh, the first thing that happens is init, and then the next part is that uh, it always has to be true that next is valid for the set of variables we have. That's what that second line means. And then um, the next one is saying, and we're guaranteeing weak fairness over those same set of variables. So VARS is actually defined way back here. I think I bet you, I'm sure you all remembered, but I forgot. So um, right here, VARS is defined as server and time. So it's just a little tuple of the two uh, different variables. So it's saying across all our variables in the system, the model is valid. That's really all that spec means. And so this is good path, right? So I like to think of spec as good path. So I try and keep things that are, um, well, I mean, I, I guess spec is the model. That's not right. I don't, but I keep, my, I keep my temporal formulas and stuff separate from it. So it's not going to be in here. All right. But that's just the model. Now we need to talk about what properties does this model have. So the first set of properties are invariant properties, which are very familiar from people who do type programming because types are a form of invariant property and probably the most common form of invariant property. And then there's live pro liveness properties, which are really, um, they're um, saying, making sure that the thing does the thing it's supposed to, right? So that the end states, liveness is about end states, that your end state gets to something that you expect. And then the last one is action properties, right? So action properties are something in between those two is how I like to think about it. So given some set of conditions, this thing will happen, or this thing will eventually happen. Those are both questions you can ask in TLA plus, and they're very nice. So the easiest one first. Like I said, it's very much like type, so a very classic invariant property is type OK. Right? So what am I doing here? I'm making sure that the server variable we have is in the set of the server set that we made earlier, and that, and that the time variable that we have was in the set of uh, the time property, the time set we made earlier, right? So that means that time has to be between zero and the time limit. So uh, those will be checked throughout the model. It's not quite the same as a type, right? Because it's also looking at the terms and like adjusting it. So it's not something that's happening at static. There's no compile time. Like it's checking it all the time, all the way through the model. Um, but it's a nice way to think of it. So I, I've gone very fast. Are there any questions? Am I going too fast? People getting it? Good? All right. 
everyone is, is looking at me like I should go on. So I will. Um, okay, so, uh, so these are a little different order than the bulleting, but I'll go through it this way. Uh, action properties um, are things like this, right? So no message prop. So what this is saying uh, is um, that if the server status is unconnected, uh, the next thing that happens should always be uh, that the message is equal to none. So that's a, that needs to be a guaranteed by the system. So the next thing that happens is the message is none. Uh, and so the little box in the front, that just means uh, that this always happens, always, and then the condition in the second set of angle brackets, and then it's uh, contextualized under underscore vars. So uh, the way that Leslie Lamport describes this is you imagine that every single variable in the entire world is always there, and we only care about these two. So um, I'm sure that's not what's actually happening, but it's a good way of thinking of it. So um, yeah, so this is saying that if our status goes to unconnected, the next in the next state, so server prime, we should see that go to none always. So it's a good property to make sure you have. And this is an example of a liveness property. So uh, a liveness property, like I said, it just makes sure that the thing does things you want it to do. So these little less than, greater than, that's saying eventually. And what this says is eventually we're going to get a POM, right? Because if our model is testing stuff, we should eventually get a POM. Otherwise, our model's not really doing anything. If we're never getting Pong, how do we even know things are working? So you can have a whole bunch of these. Eventually, we get a Pong. Eventually, we get a ping. Eventually, we see a timeout. You know, you just keep adding and adding and adding. And these, are, these two are the things that are most likely to come up in review, in a model review session. Um, if you've got a few people who understand PLA enough to read through the model, they can be like, OK, but how do you know that's actually happening? Uh, you know, are you making sure that those things really work? They're also properties that become tests in a very natural way, right? So these become deeper system tests once you write the code. So I really think of these as the places where the TLA and the programming language meet, is in your liveness model. So whatever model you have, uh, the properties should be sort of the boundary layer between the model and the system. At least any good model should do that. Um, so this is the TLA toolbox. So I just want to show, so like, it's like a, like a GUI. And there's also a VS Code plugin. I, I don't use the VS Code plugin, so, but I hear it's very good. Um, but uh, here you can set stuff like those constants. You can watch the model iterate through. Um, you can see, uh, you, you can actually do debug. You can do stack traces here and actually like, trace through the model. You can do print statements. All kinds of stuff, and actually like work with the code like you had a you know general debugger tool, which is really cool. Um, uh, and I have a, a few slides about that, right? So here's like an example of an error trace. Um, so here you're saying here it says you know something went wrong with the model, um, and then it gives you a little highlight so you can see it happened at this state of the model, and then this is what went wrong. It was in between state number two and number three that we got a problem. Um, I don't remember what the problem was anymore. I've changed this model a few times since then. I'll show you the final one. But um, yeah, so I don't know. It's really, really nice to be able to do that kind of stuff. And then I mentioned there's a configuration so you can set stuff up. So you don't always have to have every property running all the time. Um, this is especially important because as you can imagine, like I mentioned, it's like there's a bit of combinatorics happening. So if you have a property like eventual ping, to check something like eventual ping might take a very long time, depending on the size of the model. Um, so you might want to turn that off or, and then do other stuff and then turn it back on to let it run overnight um, or for an hour, depending on the size of your model. And that's something I should say. Like, I try and make it, like if I have a model that's taking more than like, so what we've had, we've built models at file that take a day to run. And I always wonder, because like you hear about Amazon using TLA Plus, I really would love to know how long their model takes to run. But, um, but if, if models start taking 30, 40 minutes, I, that's not what I want out of TLA. That's not what I want. But it's totally possible to do that. But I like to try and keep it a little simpler. I might break that into two or three models. And yes, you can compose them. Again, I just feel like it makes everything get really slow when you start to do that. And I'm much more interested in using this as a quick test, as, you know, as, as so, sort of like pseudocode, like really smart pseudocode. Um, so 
somebody's probably wouldn't, wouldn't like that. But uh, uh, yeah, so here's where you set your time limit. I mentioned earlier, this is where you set your constants. Um, uh, what's it checking? It's checking to make sure nothing just breaks. That's what deadlock means, that the two states can't, you can't get to, to out of a state or into a state. Um, and then also it checks the properties that you give it. Um, you have your type OK, which is the invariant, and then the ones below are your uh, temporal formulas. So we have eventual pong and uh, no messages in that one. OK. All right, that's going well because I'm sort of halfway through. And now we're going to talk a little Haskell. So like I said, TLA plus doesn't generate code. Um, one thing that's lovely about Haskell plus TLA, like I said, I see the properties as the way of unifying these. Haskell has some of the best, I think, some of the best property testing systems in programming languages. Um, and so it makes a, you can use quick check or whatever your system is to double check all those properties. Um, it makes it a very natural transition from the ideas in the model to the ideas in the programming language for a lot of reasons. Um, so this is sort of how I th see things going. You have your states uh, in your TLA model. They sort of become Haskell code again, and then now they're types. Your predicates in the model become functions. Um, but you know that's not one to one. So don't think you're going to write some predicate in the TLA, and now you're going to have exactly that same thing on the other side in Haskell. Instead, it might be a set of them, but it's the right way to think of it. The actions of the code are your functions in Haskell. The actions of the code are properties. Uh, our predicates in uh, TLA. Um, and then properties, properties is probably the most one-to-one, -one, but even there, there's a, there's a little bit of grind. I mean, if there wasn't any grind, I'd just use Haskell, right? So it makes complete sense that there is. Um, so, you know, the properties in TLA plus become property tests in Haskell. Um, so uh, that's, I think that's really my favorite part. Um, so I asked about TLA plus. How many people have, have here in the audience have programmed in Haskell? I better get two hands back from the people I brought. So, okay. Yeah, so I saw three hands go up. So less than TLA, TLA plus, that's cool. I, I, I mean, you know, I think TLA plus has a lot of broad applicability, so that makes sense. Okay, so what have we done just to review so far? We've come up with a block model. We've taken that model, we've moved it over to TLA plus. We've added some type properties. We've added some liveness properties. We've added some action properties. Now we're going to take all that and we're going to do some stuff in Haskell. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our model and try and understand what things our model has talked about and what things our model hasn't talked about. So one of the obvious things our model hasn't talked about is, oh, we have this thing called time. Where does the time come from? Um, time comes from the system usually, right? So it's a natural place to start looking for effects. So looking for what you're not thinking about when you're writing that model but still is important to the program, gives you a nice way of like, you start writing those down and you look and you see, oh, these are my effects. These are the things like, you know, how did I get that file from disk? How did I get that network setting? How did I get that time? Those are going to be your natural effects. And of course, Haskell's famous for separating effects from the uh, state logic of your code, another place that they, it plays very nicely with TLA. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, design the effect model. Then you build the program against the effect model in pure mode. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I'll show a little bit of it, but like, I just mean that you are going to either use, uh, you're going to use some sort of MTL system or some sort of effect system that Haskell has. There's, I feel like there's a new one that comes out every week. MTL is what I use. It's very good. I have a link to uh, what it is. But basically, what it allows you to do is uh, turn, uh, is to swap out effects that you are non-deterministic or given to you by the system for a set of effects that you have full control over. So you can swap them out easily and go back and forth. And so that's the first thing you do is, you know, program against the effect model in that super deterministic setting, right? So you can make it as close as you can to the TLA model. Um, then you can add your liveness tests, you can add your action tests, and then once you have all that done and you feel really good about, you know, sort of all that style of system, you can then go, and um, start working on your working on the actual effect. How you actually going to get the time? How you actually going to get the network settings? Or maybe you have somebody working on that independently, right? If you have a large team, and it's not just one person. You have one person that's worrying about testing 
the network and another person worrying about testing the system. There's a lot of natural division of labor there. It's very nice. Um, again, that kind of happens because you have a model, and that's one of the things that's beautiful about that sort of thing. Um, um, all, yeah, so I don't have this on the slide, but I want to say, like, you know, I wrote this down like it's some sort of like, hey, just run through it. It all it always goes this way. Of course it doesn't. You often discover things you didn't think about in your model while you're writing down tests, while you're writing down systems in Haskell. Update as you feel like, you know. I mean, if, if you're in the kind of place where you want to make sure that model has very tight correspondence to the code, do it. Don't do it. I don't know. It's probably better to do it. But the important thing is it gave you a nice starting spot regardless of what you do. Um, and you'll just kind of keep iterating from here. I really do recommend doing it for, at least for the first few iterations because you you'll then like see new stuff you didn't think about when you move it back into the TLA model. Um, but yeah, so like I wrote them down in this nice set of steps, but that's not how we do things. That's, I don't think that's how maybe somebody who's a lot better at this than I am would do it, but it's not me. All right. So like I said, the first thing we do, we design an effect model. Okay, so this is sort of like the MTL stuff. Um, you'll see like you'll have this shared set of types and then you have your different effects that you're talking about. So in my case, I'm splitting them out between time and the rest of the network effects. Um, there's some other effects about storage that I would need here. Um, you know, you should be able to, to look at this and understand where things are associated with, with the TLA model. If you have everything named right on both sides, uh, you know, it's, it's really more of a, of a look and check. You might have some nice comments. Um, but these are, these are instances in Haskell, and again, like, there's so many good Haskell resources these days. I just feel like I wanted to talk something bigger than just going into all these, like, details here. Um, but basically, this is way, the way you give a type in Haskell a property is by adding a class to it. So very similar to, um, you know, a virtual class in Java, something like that. Um, I, I'm sure somebody's angry that I said that, but I mean, it feels that way, so. Whatever. Um, right, so then you build your program against the effect model. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you're not referencing effects directly. So everything that you do, you're going to reference um, as part of your effect model. So for example, uh, here I have set network state is the first line, right? So that set network state would be a property defined by a type class on that model, right? And then uh, when I'm running in pure mode, set network state is probably just going to return some state I tell it to or do something I tell it to and put that you know, variable in memory or do something silly and easy. And then in real mode, set network state is probably going to do five system calls, screw up something whenever it tries to talk to the kernel. I'm going to spend three hours debugging on the debug side and be glad that I'm done with all of this. So, um, uh, yeah, so... Uh, you know, but this is, so this would be like an example, an example thing you might want to do is turning the system off, right? So you'd set the network state to inactive, uh, you would then change your network profile out, that's what set network profile is. Again, that would be like an effect in a real system. Um, and then um, the, uh, you, you then have to handle the result of setting that network profile inactive. Um, I think I have a slide later, but I'll go ahead and say it now in case I don't. Uh, one thing you'll notice is a lot of rights and lefts. When, when I program, like, I want to think of that, of, of that effect as completely captured. To me, an exception is an effect. So in Haskell, the proper way to do this, in my opinion, is uh, to uh, catch the effect, turn it, into a, turn it into an either, and return either um, the effect error or a good value. Um, so all your effects should, again, the, the, the handling of exceptions should be handed over to the uh, effects testing team, I guess is a way of thinking of it. It's usually just me, but still. Okay, so what does a, you know, I've been talking about fake effects. What does a fake effect look like? Here's an example of one, right? So I'm going to write an instance for my type class has timer. Uh, uh, the has timer has one method, which is get tick. It's really fun doing this because, like, nobody calls these things methods, and nobody, like, I'm just like, but it's normally just called a function. But uh, anyway, so, um, and, and this is an example of one. In my example, I'm just grabbing from a set of, a set of uh, variables that are part of my test framework. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab 
my, the value that represents time, and I'm incrementing that time value. So that's all I'm doing. And this was an example of something that you would do on the test side. That's a fake effect. Um, uh, it'll, one thing that's great about, about mocking out time is, like, let's say you have some process that's supposed to be a timeout in five minutes. I don't want my test to run for five minutes. I want to run for two seconds. By mocking out time, I can have a time, you know, A, B, and I'm there. But I'm still using exactly the same framework that I'll be using later. And that's something I think is really powerful about Haskell as opposed to, say, like a mocking framework. At least some of the mocking frameworks I know about, admittedly, I don't know a lot about them, but it seems to me like they're much more separated environments. Whereas here, like the function is the same function, the comparisons are the same comparisons, and it's only the input data that changes. Um, right, so then uh, the next thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to get some property tests together to do our liveness and our action properties, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I can't just do that. That's not like a thing that's built in. So just kind of give you a, a quick example of what we've built at Plow to do this sort of thing. Um, so I have an assertion and then I have an initial state. That's what assertion and it is. And then I have a very long name, property, construction, for transition function. Um, and normally we don't write functions like that. Um, I think I just formatted it badly. Um, anyway, so then <laughs> it's going to uh, it's going to build me my initial conditions using the init, set up an environment, set up my timeout, um, and then it's going to uh, uh, set up the tr set up the transition states again, and then finally run the system. Right. So now it's going to run the system. And then after, you know, however long that test, that's really, that's really what the test is, right, is running that system. Then at the end of that, I'm going to fetch the final state that we got to as next, and then um, write, against, write it against an assertion. So init prime to next, right? So I'm going to pass my, whatever my assertion is, and then I'm going to pass it what the initial conditions were, and then what the uh, output conditions were. And if you'll notice, assertion comes in as an argument at the top two, so I'm sort of creating a way of passing different assertions in and creating a testing framework to build tests that look like TLA properties. So here's an example of that with more underscoring and less ridiculousness. Um, uh, right, so property for, uh, for transition function. Um, ignore the void tracer part. That's uh, from our code. Probably don't need that. Um, but then you have your assertion. Uh, again, I set this up. My my new init, um, sorry. Yes, I think the copy I made. Darn. Um, but really, really, so the example of like property eventually tick, you would say, oh yeah, no, there, uh, there we go. So you assert that the status, uh, that in the next state, the status will be active. Right, so that's the, that's the property test, right? So you're you're making sure that by the time that the model ends running, your next state is going to be active, so that you've come all the way back around. So obviously you probably have one that was inactive, you'd have one that was active. Uh, so I hand waved. That was me getting confused by my own hand waving. So I can't imagine what it's like for you guys, but uh, uh, you know the idea here is that uh, a bunch of stuff happens, and then you run this assertion at the end. Yeah. So um, once you have, uh, again, all these, these are the properties. I feel like these properties should really have the same name as in your TLA. It's the closest binding to the TLA model. Um, uh, you know, this is where you have your back and forth discussion. So you might go back to TLA model, add another property, especially if something doesn't behave the way you thought it would here. Maybe you didn't quite capture it correctly in your model. Um, you can go adjust your model, then adjust the test, or adjust the system, like whatever you need to do. I feel like this is like the big win is being able to tie in the property system. It's really the whole reason I wanted to get this talk was to get to that, that piece. Um, but there are some other neat things I'm showing, like the effects system in Haskell. You could do all this without those neat effects systems. It just makes it all easier. Great. So, um, you know, uh, we want to build, uh, once you're done with all that, you then want to swap, uh, swap your faked out uh, uh, test effects with real effects. I just kind of want to show an example of what that would look, what, what would look like with a very simple example, which would be like fetching the time, right? So here I have a system library fetching UTC time. 
I'm catching if there's any error. I'm converting that error into some sort of type that makes sense to me, and then just returning the time. But from the point of view of every other part, once I say get tick right there, it's always the same, right? So all I did is in one place I'm running real, and in one place I'm running fake. So I would need some other library to make sure that the rest of this function makes sense. In the case of fetch to UTC time, really that's probably not going to be me, but if it's like Scott's fancy new file system handler, I probably would do a little bit more testing. Um, although this one will probably just bite me just as much, so there you go. Um, it has the word time in it. All right, so yeah, so um, like I said, you have to handle your effects once you go, uh, once you go into the real world, uh, you really want to try and keep the, keep the boundary clean. So use your either's to catch exceptions to the effects. Uh, when you're writing your effects down, have them, have them return your error classes. Um, yeah, keep the IO functions as an as entirely separate test suite. A lot of times I'll have like, you know, a whole different thing that's like test storage model, test whatever, and then I'll have this as testing at a higher system level. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, again, I guess, I guess I just repeated myself, but yeah, it is very important to catch those effects and not just pass them up the model. Because it's very, it, it, you'll, you'll find your code looks a lot cleaner uh, or requires less craftiness if you just let those effects be, I mean, let those exceptions disappear in the ether. Um, I don't know, everybody's a developer here and knows why that's a bad idea, but it's very easy to do, so. All right, so closing thoughts, you know, um, and I've seen this happen, like when you write something down formally, we've used this for big systems that do take a couple, you know, a day or so to run. We use it for little systems, and every time we've used it, developers always feel like, I can't believe how much more I feel like I understand the system. It really helps you feel like you really have direction. Um, and I, I'm just a huge fan of, do, of doing that. Um, we use a lot of these kind of things at Plow. And um, you know, we don't use TLA plus models for everything. So we, we model other things in other ways. Um, but um, you know, it's just a matter of finding like, the right tool for the right job. That's why I say, like, don't try and do everything. Like, sometimes it makes more sense. Like with effects, I, I don't know how you formally model effects. I, I think that'd just be a big waste of time. But again, somebody probably disagrees with me. Uh, I, it's, it's just much easier to have a nice set of tests and then move on with life. Um, uh, yeah, and then like I said, use the model to build an effects and property test system. It's been sort of the theme of the day. And like I said, I got this big um, link slide, which I'll share. Uh, probably my favorite stuff from here, this learntla.com is pretty new, and they keep changing it, so I had to keep changing all my links because I have a big help file and all this stuff. It goes in real deep, and it's from a systems perspective. So Le uh, Leslie Lamport's site is amazing, and it's where you should start because you should start by watching those videos because you're going to understand how he thinks about it. If you're more of a reader and less of a watcher, uh, you know, he's got some great papers too. Um, goes just in a lot of detail about the theory behind uh, Temporal logic of application, and um, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 great stuff. But the learn TLA side, you know, that's where I really learned the most about action properties and liveness and how to think about them from a systems perspective. And it's just a, it's a wonderful website, super good. And then there's lots of examples of that GitHub repo. Um, that uh, and then that three three layer Haskell cake. That's all about the effect systems that I was talking about. It's done from the point of view of MTL. Very good stuff. Um, and then different, different property testing systems are outlined. I like Hedgehog more, but quite honestly, I use Quick, Quick Check more. I, I try and use Hedgehog, but Quick Check's just like baked into Haskell, so. Yep, I don't know what I did there, but yeah. That's really all I have, everyone. I think that timed out about right. Yeah, sure it did. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you so much, and uh, look forward to the next one when somebody other than me is talking. <laughs>